Good morning. Let's stand to our feet, church. Let's declare this out together. says this clap your hands all peoples yeah. Amen. shout to God with loud songs of joy That's right. we praise you, God. for the Lord the most high is to be feared a great king over all the earth he subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet he chose our heritage for us the pride of Jacob whom he loves. 
God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. This past week we had Camp Whatever and it was awesome, wasn't it guys? Yes. That is our student camp. It was an incredible time. Thank you, church, for praying. And I know there'll be more to talk about it and you'll get to see a glimpse of it here in just a minute. But we're gonna sing a song that we, as a church, we ended up writing it. And, uh, you know, it's a big part of our heart and our ministry. It's to sing a new song unto the Lord. And so we believe in writing songs, like we write sermons, right? And so these are the prayers of the people and this song is a song called Everything All to the King. I don't know where you are today. I, my prayer is um, that you would just be quick to surrender to the Lord. And we realize that that isn't really a, a great human thing. We're not really quick at surrendering. But as we acknowledge that Jesus is the King, in this place, church, the kingdom of God dwells. And the kingdom of God, it is the King's power over the King's people in the king's place and this is the king's place so we give everything all to him we're going to teach it to you why don't you join in with this song once it becomes a part of you this is everything all to the king Presence is alive and in this room. Your kingdom is a banner breaking through. Oh, Father, see your people here and now who delight in your Son. We delight in you. It's Jesus. Jesus, ruler of heaven and earth, matchless in power and worth. Jesus, Jesus, awestruck we fall at your feet, everything all to the King.
everything all to the key. Sing Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, ruler of heaven and earth. Jesus, Jesus. Struck, we fall at your feet, everything all to the king. Now is in 
We worship you in spirit and in truth. This is your house, this is your place. You are a king because you have a people. You are a king because you have a place. And you are a king because you have all the power. So let your kingdom come and let your will be done here in Smyrna as it is in heaven right now, Lord God. We give you all the glory. We give you everything. You're the king. It's in your name we pray. Jesus, amen. Church, you may be seated. Let's see what happened at camp. I tell you, if you went to camp, you were a leader or a student, did y'all have a good time? <laughs> That's awesome, man. God is so good. God is so faithful, and we are so excited. You might see some leaders and students kind of walking around, kind of, it was a long week, but God showed up in an amazing way, and we are so, so thankful. If you're a guest with us, uh, this past week, we got back from youth camp, and, or we went to youth camp. We just got back last Friday, and God just just moved in some amazing ways. And, and over the next few weeks, you're going to see that as, as we celebrate all the things that God has done. Um, I want to just go ahead and plug it. July 20th, we're going to have a camp share service where we want to invite you as our church to come see what God did, hear what God did at camp, whatever, this year, and just uh, experience uh, what God did, because God God moved in some huge ways. And just a few of those things, God saved almost 25 students this week at camp. He is so faithful. He is so faithful. Nearly 30 students came up and said, you know what, I've been saved before. I want to be baptized. I want to take that next step into, uh, into baptism. So we celebrate with those students. We, almost, we had 30 students feel a call to some type of vocational mis- uh, ministry at camp, whatever, this year. God moved in some awesome, awesome ways. And there was a lot of reasons for that. One of those ways is, or reasons is because you fasted. 
You prayed for us. Many of you took one of those uh, bracelets that we gave out last week and you prayed for those students. Thank you for praying. Thank you for fasting with us. God just showed up on that Wednesday night as we ended, as you ended your fast, God moved. And I just wanna tell you, he was so faithful. Many of you, many of you gave that students would go to camp. And we wanna, we wanna tell you to continue to give as ministry, uh, ministry happens here at the church. We, we wanna continue to, to remind you, you can give online, you can give on the boxes in the room. You can, you can give so many different ways so that ministry can happen because God is moving and we get to be a part of it. Like we get to walk into this. I think about all the people that served and all the people that gave up their week. So many volunteers. We had over 115 volunteers serve our student ministry this week. That was so good. So good. And we had over 550 teenagers on the mountain this week. God just moved. If you're a guest with us hearing these things and, and wanna know more about our church, we would love to chat with you about that. Take one of these cards, fill it out and give it to us on the way out. And we would love to just get for some, give you some uh, information about our church and we would love to get to know you a little bit as well because we want you to be a part of what God is doing because he's moving. This week, we, we had our amazing volunteers. We had our amazing, our elder team came and taught in our, our uh, morning sessions over cultural issues and how to look at those through a, uh, a biblical worldview. It was, it was amazing time every morning in our morning sessions. In our evening sessions, we were so blessed to have a familiar face come and lead us for camp this year. David McCain and led our, our evening sessions and just did a phenomenal, phenomenal job walking us through our theme chapter of, uh, for the week, Isaiah 26. Our theme was Yahweh. And he led us right through that scripture. And we were so blessed. And in fact, we were, we, we, we had to have one more session with him. So this, this week, we're, we've asked David to come and lead us this morning in, in our sermon this morning. So, so David, he's going to make his way up here. And, and, and David, I can't say thanks enough, man. You led our, our, our week well in our sermons. And, and I'm just blessed to just call you a friend, a fellow laborer in the gospel. And I'm glad Amen. that you're here. Give him the fire, the passion, <laughs> Amen. little red-faced head. <laughs> He came with it this week, and I just want to pray for you as you yeah, open do. up the word and, yeah. and lead us. God, we love you, and I thank you for what you did this week at camp. We give you glory and give you praise because you deserve it all. You moved, and you were faithful, God. And so this morning, as we open up your word, we thank you for David leading us each evening. And God, I have no doubt that you're going to speak through him this morning. And so, Father, use his words Use his voice to convey what you have to say to us this morning, God. We love you, we praise you, and we need you. Yahweh, you are to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. You know, I talked to Ryan this morning. You know, there's a lot of students setting the trend in student ministry of the mullet. And I tried to talk Ryan into going mullet. He said his wife wouldn't let him. So uh, it's probably a safe thing. Probably a good thing. Man, what a joy it was to be at camp this past week, um, you know, I got home. I didn't do nearly as much as the other leaders, uh, but I still took a Friday nap, and it was one of those naps where my wife had to come in and be like, hey, are you alive? Uh, kind of nap, like one of those where you wake up, and I'm not sure where I'm at. My arms are really heavy, you know, like one of those kind of naps. And uh, But I think I'm recovered to a certain degree, and I'm just so thankful for every leader that got the opportunity uh, to, to, to go to camp. You know, if you... Uh, uh, have, have ever thought about that or wanted to do that, I would encourage you to be a part of that. You know, I heard this stat this week that uh, with students or really anybody in particular, when you have a three to five day intensive kind of a way like that, it, it, it's basically the equivalent of an entire year of spiritual maturity. And so if you get the opportunity to send your students to that next year, I would greatly encourage you. But as a leader, I would say, man, all the leaders that went would probably gather you up and say God did a great work in their life as well. And so I mean, if you want to be a part of God moving through the student ministry, I'd implore you to be a part of that. I'm just so thankful for the leadership of this church. Obviously, the student team has been so gracious uh, to, to me. And, uh, and then obviously, uh, I love this place. I, I love Pat. 
Uh, Pat's like a father to me in a lot of ways, and, and I'm just so thankful for his influence and ministry and discipleship over even my own life, and I'm very thankful for, for him and his leadership here. And if you don't know who I am, uh, I used to be on staff here for almost 14 years, and I served in a lot of different capacities, started in student ministry, and thankfully they didn't fire me, and they kept me around for a little while. And, and uh, then we left, I think it was 2012, we, we went over to... Um, uh, plant pastor, our Bangkok campus. We were there for, for three years. We came back and we started the Riverdale campus and we're there for four years. And, and, and then God called us to Florida in uh, pastoring in, in South Florida. So this church um, has a dear place in my heart. Uh, I love this place. I love these people. Every time I get to come and hang out with you and see you, it's like I'm home. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's just family here. And uh, I always love just the, the, the embrace of you uh, to me and my family back in. So we're just thankful for you. Uh, I'm going to pray. And if you've got your Bibles, Matthew 6 is where we're going to be this morning. And I would encourage you to turn there or flip in your devices and you can read there with me. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, be in chapter 6, starting in verse 25, so you can begin getting, uh, begin getting there. Let me pray for us. Lord, uh, again, the preaching of your word is about you, you, <laughs> your power, your word doing what your word can do, namely conform us, conforming us into the image of Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would do that very thing, that you would supernaturally, through the preaching of your word, that the word and the spirit of God would work in us to make us more like Jesus. I pray for every believer in this room that they would be edified, they would be encouraged uh, to trust you, to walk in you, to see you as king above it all. And I pray that every believer, if we're wrestling with some type of sin, would be more equipped to, to, to kill that sin and walk in your holiness. For every person in here who is not yet a believer, I pray uh, that you would open their eyes to the truth of that gospel. And they would be saved this morning. And specifically, God, I just thank you for these Students sitting on the front leading this church in worship. I pray, God, that you would continue to raise them up, the next generation of godly young men and women, to see Christ exalted and to see Christ put on display and to see the glory of God cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. God, bless us in this time. May we worship and exalt your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, yes, we're in chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, and um, when the elders came to me and asked me to, to preach, I, I jumped at the opportunity. said, so I'd love to be a part of the gathering on Sunday mornings, and, um, and, and love to be a part of what God is doing in here. So I, what I want to do is I want to read, I want to read the text, and I want to tell you a little bit about why it's so, it's like, so funny that God would have me in this passage. If a very personal God would have me in this passage. I want to walk you through it. But let's read the text together. Uh, starting in verse 25, says this. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Verse 33, underline this if you've got it in your Bibles, highlight it. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, 
Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring, be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Praise God for his word. When uh, the, the elders came and asked me to, to preach, again, I jumped at it, and then they said it was Matthew 6, and I was like, oh, Lord, of course it would be Matthew 6. Of course it would be a passage about worry and anxiety. Uh, see, this year for my family has been one of the toughest years we've ever walked through. Um, as you know, two and a half years ago, we left this place and was sent out really well. We love this place. We felt God calling us to pastor and, and, uh, and to be a lead pastor in that kind of capacity. And we began to pastor in South Florida and everything was going well. I mean, uh, we, we grew through COVID, which is kind of unheard of in church world. We were baptizing more people than the church had in years. Um, financially, God was blessing um, in phenomenal ways. But at the beginning of this year, when I, turned, re- re- when I returned there from here, I was on crim- Christmas vacation, I returned there from here, uh, everything hit the fan. <laughs> everything kind of went sideways. And uh, long story short, I ended up submitting my resignation uh, to the church that I was pastoring. And uh, it was a difficult, difficult season for us. There were months, uh, those first couple months, January, February, March, were some of the hardest months that my family has ever walked through. And you want to talk about being anxious. You want to talk about filled with worry. You want to talk about having to wrestle with God and Lord, what are you doing? We live this. And... Uh, and it was tough days. I mean, you know, we, we're, my wife and I encouraged each other, coming together and, and just reading Scripture over one another, truths to get our heart to believe it. I never felt a psalm more than I felt Psalm 43, which said, why are you downcast, oh, my soul? And then the, then the psalmist pleads with his own soul, hoping God. I felt that. And then God moved in a season for us of healing and really growth and, and a lot of different things. And, and, and we begin to pray about, okay, God, what is next for us? What do you have for us? What's next? And so we begin to pray, you know, what, what are we going to do? What, are we going to go back home? Are we Are going to go some other place? What, what are we going to do? And God began to move in us uh, towards church planning, I'm planning a church. Um, you think you, ha- I, I thought I had stress and anxiety before that. Then I decided I'm going to plant a church, right? And, uh, you know, I've kind of done that. Thanks to my experience with LifePoint, I've kind of done church starting in some ways. You know, we went to Bangkok and kind of started a church there. We came back with a, a group of people. We started the Borough Riverdale campus. So I had some experience with the, with the people side of that. But when you begin to jump into church planning, there's all this the legal side of it, the constitution and bylaws, the 501c3s, you know, the, the, just all the work, the finding a location, the funding, the ministry, the, you know, the, all the stuff. I got to buy sound equipment, got to figure, you know, who's going to come and who's going to be a part of this and what we're going to call ourselves, which I'm not creative at all. So it's like, what kind of name, you know, I'm struggling. It's like naming your kid. You don't really know if you like it till they're already born. You start calling them that for a while. You know, it's just a, you know, just a stressful, anxious time. And on top of that, South Florida, if you, you talk about planting a church in South Florida, South Florida is known as the place where church plants go to die. And I've seen it. It's tough. And it's not just tough because of the lostness in South Florida. I'm telling you, it's tough because of the church people. It's a tough place to plant a church. And so for me to get this passage, I just said, okay, God, (laughs) these things have been real to me in the last six months. These are things I've had to wrestle with. Have I been perfect? By no means. By no means. But God has been faithful. And I think in some way, all of us, Just as I desperately needed to hear this message again, I think all of us need to desperately hear this message again. But five times he says to the text, do not be anxious. Uh, Thanks, Lord. Um, Okay, I hear you. Now help me, (laughs) right? 
Don't be anxious. You know, uh, and, and what does anxiety look like? I mean, for some of you, it's you stay awake all night worrying about your family or, or your kids. Some of you are, are really stressed about, you know, paying $5, uh, you know, a gallon for gas. How are we going to do that and get to work and eat? A lot of anxiety. Uh, some of us are just, you know, constantly worried about acceptance with other people and, you know, just being included or having our Facebook posts liked or whatever. We're just anxious about a lot of different things. And my, my point is like, yes, Jesus spoke these words over 2,000 words, 2,000 years ago, but man, they ring true again this morning. And I think that if we kind of get at the heart and, and really kind of the antidote of what Jesus is gonna lay out for worry, that it, it's really gonna set up a dichotomy that the things in our life, are indifferent, whether good, bad, you know, whatever they are, the things in our life have one of two options. They'll either lead us to worry, anxiety, stress, or they'll lead us to worship, dependency, trust in Christ. Uh, you know, they'll lead us to, to wringing our hands, or they'll lead us to our knees. And so I think we're going to see that. So what, what I want us to look at first is the, the worry in the world. Again, the text uh, talks, do not be anxious five different times. And I think there's a difference. There's a difference in our life between legitimate concern and care over the things that happen. You know, when we talk about don't worry, you know, it's, it's a, what is it? Bob Marley says, don't worry, be happy. You know, that, that gives this vibe of not, not just not worrying, just gives this vibe of I don't care right? That's not what we're talking about here. Jesus isn't saying, look at the things in your life and just don't care. That's not what he's saying. Obviously, Jesus cared about a lot of things. He was passionate about a lot of things. So he's not telling you just to walk through life and just oblivious as if nothing can phase you. That's not what he's talking about. And there's this line between care, like genuine concern, before it leads into sinful anxiety. Now, for us, where that line hits is so difficult to pin down, right? Like we start out really well. We start out with a genuine concern and we're taking it to the Lord and, and we're asking him to help and move. And then all of a sudden we look up and we're like, oh man, like I think we've moved into sinful anxiety here. We're worrying, we're stressed. And so Jesus is really setting for us an example of what it is to care about things but not be, not be anxious. You know the word for worry is derived from a German word that, just, that, that, that means to choke or to strangle. And that's what happens when we worry about the things in our life, right? It just chokes the life, the joy out of us. And so if you're like me, so many times the things I worry about never happen. If I had, um, if, if, if every time that I've had an argument in my head or in my car that I was going to have with someone and that argument never transpired in real life, why? We're just stressed. You're worried. You, oh, if he says this, I'm going to say this. Or if she does this, if my boss does this, if my kids do this, and you begin to wring your hands over things. My encouragement, and I think what the Lord would say, is stop working those things out in your own wisdom and take them to him. It's the beauty of the scriptures where he says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord who cares for you. And so we're going we're gonna to mull it over in our head anyway. Why not stop just trying to figure out our own solutions and bring the Lord into it? But this is what we do. We worry, and, and, and we often worry a lot. Now, this text, it's important to look at the text in the context of the whole of the chapter. If you remember last week, uh, I got to worship at the, our Riverdale campus and sit under Kyle Goins preaching love what, what God is doing through Kyle and just praising the Lord for all, all that's going on in the Riverdale campus. But last week we saw really some points. You saw there were two kingdoms, there were two visions, and there were two masters. And, uh, and, and, and basically what, what the scriptures are leading up to, to our text today is again, reiterating the fact that there's one or two ways you're gonna go. You're either gonna go in the sense of ang anxiety and anxious, or you're gonna go in the way of trusting the Lord. Uh, there's a great, preacher, theologian, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he points out that the previous section in when dealing with finances and things is really aimed at the wealthy and that this text are aimed at those that aren't as wealthy. Either they're poor, they're more average in their, in their wealth. 
And, and so he's saying that it's pointing to the affluent and the un, unfortunate. Now, to the rich, which I would argue includes most of us. Now, you would say, not me, you know, you have two vehicles, you, you know, I mean, like most of us, when, and if you lay it on the backdrop of the humanity of the world, fall into the rich category, right? And, uh, and so to the rich, you know, the temptation is to be gripped by getting more be gripped by gaining and, and accumulating more wealth, amassing more riches, growing in your net worth, right? I've often found uh, th- th- that the, the truth from the great theologian Biggie Smalls rings true, more money, more problems. We wring our hands over, we gotta get something else, we need something else, and you heard that message last week. But I think today too, I think it's important to speak to those who are poor, the temptation for those who don't have is to wring our hands over the things we don't have. Instead of, as Paul would learn to be content, whether he had a lot or little, to, to trust the Lord in what he has allotted for us and given us. It doesn't mean we're lazy, but it, but it means we take all those cares and anxieties to the Lord. And I think overall, Jesus is saying just that life is more. It's more than the clothes you wear. It's more than the lifestyle you have, the car you drive. It's more than what school your kids go to. It's, it's more than those things. It's, a, it's really a, de- a lesson here on trust and dependency. And Jesus, uh, he's a great illustrator. He points to the birds and the lilies. I got the opportunity, what, three or four years ago to go to Israel with some of you, and we sat on the Sermon of the Mount, the mountainside where the Sermon on the Mount was given, and and you sit there and you see the flowers of the field and you see and you hear uh, the birds of the air and Jesus is just gathering a people around and said, hey, look at these flowers, look at their clothes, they're far more splendorous than even Solomon in all of his glory. And, and look at the birds, they don't, they don't toil for their food, they don't store up for their food, they go get one worm at a time and, and God takes care of them. And how much more will he take care of you? It's, a, it's an argument from the lesser to the greater that Jesus is making. He's saying, if God is faithful to birds and flowers, you who are made in the very image of God, the very pinnacle of his creation, the one who he gave his very son to save, how much more will he take care of you? How much more will he meet your needs? How much more? So he's he's making this argument here, and then he's going to point what I think is probably the pinnacle of the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount in verse 33. I think it's the, it's, it's the main point. It's the main thrust of the entirety of the greatest sermon ever preached. If you want to go to it, and we're going to see this, this point in it uh, uh, of freedom in the kingdom. But verse 33 says this again. But seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. See, Jesus is not saying, hey, don't care about the things of life, but what he is saying is those things, wherever they rank in in order and priority of your life, should certainly fall as secondary to the kingdom of God. That you stress about your kids, it should fall as secondary to the kingdom of, of God. You seeking first the kingdom of God. That you worry about paychecks or food or whatever it is that we stress and wring our hands over, that we should be seeking first his kingdom. And I, I, I think if you talk to anyone who has had to walk through an addiction, one of the things that helps people grow through and, and, and re- get recovery from an addiction is that they, they can't just say no and walk away and think it's going to go away. It's, it's bigger than that. That, 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 that the absence of something that they have been struggling with has to be replaced with something else. And so you feel that hole, you seek something greater and higher. That's why you'll hear uh, that former addicts will, will for, uh, like pour their lives out into some, some kind of hobby. Uh, a lot of guys do gaming and different things like that. They'll pour out into something else and uh, they're replacing it with, uh, with, with something. They're saying no to this and, and, and replacing it with something. This, I, I would say this is the same thing for us uh, as Christians. Maybe some of you struggle with a particular sin. I would say you can't just 
say no to that sin without replacing it with the seeking of the kingdom of God. And thankfully, God has given us so many graces to be able to do that. I mean, the, the very blessing it is to have his word, the very blessing it is to have his church and, and to be a part of a community of faith, the very blessing it is to be able to speak with God, the very blessing it is, as many of you did this week, to, to fast and to have some close connection with God, to say no to this and replace it with presence of Christ. And, and so we do that in our life. And I think Jesus is teaching that here that he's saying, do not be anxious. Instead of being anxious, replace it with seeking of the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and all those things will be added to you, your food, your clothes, who can add another day to his life. All those things will be added to you, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. One, one of the nights of camp, the second night of camp, we talked about the passage in Isaiah 26, 8, where it says that his name and his renown are the desire of our souls. That, that, that Christianity in and of itself is a, is a heart religion that it comes down to what do you desire? And if you don't desire Christ above all things, then you may not be in Christ. And so you should examine your heart to see it is Christ is Jesus, your greatest treasure. Is Jesus your greatest desire? Matthew 5, 6, you preached through this maybe last summer, I forget when you went through it, but it said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The antidote for worry is to have a greater desire for Christ and his kingdom. I've heard it said that there are three types of people in the world. There are people, one, that don't seek God, have no desire for God. They know they have no desire for God. They don't try to have a desire for God and, and they you know, will obviously be found wanting in the end. Secondly, there are those that seek God, but not first. And those are often some of the most miserable people they try to have a foot in two camps. They try to play both sides of the road. And what I've found when you play both sides of the road, you get hit by a bus. And there's thirdly, those who seek first the kingdom of God. You're certainly not gonna do that perfectly. You're certainly not gonna do that the best you can do it. But there are people that have a, their greatest heart and desire is to seek Christ, to seek the kingdom first above anything this side of heaven over our careers, over our success, over our kids' morality, over anything. We seek first and highest the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Now, again, the Sermon of the Mount has been leading to this, the whole thing, the pinnacle, the whole point of the message, the main point, if you're putting a main point on the message on the screen, if Jesus had the screen behind him on the Sermon on the Mount, it would say, look at me, look to me, put your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. Keep your eyes on Christ. Behold him as you behold him. You become like him as you behold him. The things of the earth grow strangely dim. As you behold him, stress and anxiety loses its grip on you. As you behold him, you begin to trust him and depend upon him more. And when things, uh, storms come, your house is built on a rock instead of sand and you're able to withstand it holding tightly to Christ. Put your eyes on him. Look firmly in his face. Seek Jesus and his kingdom to meet your needs, all your needs. I heard this story of a young missionary years ago who was going to the field and he had a, a friend that walked with him to the, to the boat before he was going off uh, to share the gospel. And this friend was a wealthier friend and, he, and this friend hands the young missionary an envelope and he says to the young missionary, hey, listen, when, when there comes a time uh, and, and, and your needs aren't met, and there's no way your needs can be met, you open this envelope. And so the young missionary gets on the boat and he goes uh, overseas and, and, and serves the Lord. And for 12 years and 12 years later, he returns back to his home country and he's, he's greeted by that same friend that after they embrace that young missionary, he hands him back the envelope, still sealed, and he says to him, there was never a time that God didn't meet our needs. Church, this is what the Lord wants to do for us. 
He wants to meet our needs. I'm not talking about your wants necessarily. I'm talking about your needs. I'm talking about your, your spiritual needs, your physical needs. That Lord, the Lord wants to step in and move into your life in such a way that he turns your worry about the things of the earth. There's plenty of things for us to worry about. I mean, for the last three years, I don't know that there's been a week that there hasn't been some kind of political statement that needs to be said. And so there's worry. There's things for us to wring our hands over. But that the Lord would turn our worry to worship. I think about um, in World War II, there's a woman, named, Christian woman named Corey Tenboom. And uh, she would hide the Jews in her home. Now, obviously, um, this is a situation that would be high stress, high anxiety, right? I mean, you, 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 every time you hear just a shuffle of feet outside of your house, you're going to freak out. And obviously, she w loved the Lord, was a believer. Listen to what she says. <coughs> she says, she once wrote about it. <clears throat> she said, look around and be distressed, look inside and be depressed, look at Jesus and be at rest. I think it's a beautiful picture of what we are to do. Now our anxiety levels may not, may not be to the level of hiding Jews in the middle of World War II from, from Nazi Germans. However, it's still real to us, it's, it's still stressful we still have a weight on our shoulders. Maybe you don't know how you're going to provide for your family. You don't know how God's going to come through. Look to Jesus. Now, I do want to make something very clear. Maybe you're in here and you're not a believer, and what you've heard me say for the last half hour is you've heard me say, okay, here's what I need to do. To get less stress, I just need to do a list of things. Maybe if I go to church more or read my Bible more or, or, or do some things, some, some works, then I'll be have less stress in my life. This isn't, this isn't a, you know, one of those magazines you see when you get, come through Publix, this is top 10 ways to live with no stress. This isn't one of those kind of messages. I'm here to tell you, if you're a non-believer in this room and you're trying to use Jesus in some way, use the church in some way to gain less anxiety, you are walking a fool's way. Because the only way for us to actually embrace that side of Christ and actually experience the anxiety-relieving presence of Christ is that we have come to faith in Jesus. And that's, that's a work done by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit has come in and moved in our life in such a way to regenerate our heart. By his grace, he's given us faith to trust in him. If you're trying to get the blessings of God without him having your heart, it's never going to work. You're just going to get more stressed. You're going to put on yourself the works of religion. You're going to put on yourself legalism. And you're going to find yourself as dead as you've ever been. The only way to experience this kind of looking in the face of Christ and, 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 and seeing him and becoming uh, a walking like he walked and casting our cares about him is for him to save you. For your sin issue to be dealt with. For you, as the scripture says, to be called, given the right to be called a child of God. So maybe you've played the religion game your whole life and you've tried the thing, you know, I'll do this, I'll read the Bible, I'll do church attendance, or I'll give some money, or I'll do these kinds of things, and it's never worked out for you. I would say examine your heart to see if you're in the faith. Is it true that your desire, your greatest desire above all other competing desires, not perfectly, but aim is, is Christ? Is that true of you? Is it true of you that your heart can come along the statement that says that his name and his renown are the desire of our souls? Is that true of you? If not, you, you, you may be trying to do religion and, and it's going to end up empty. So come to Christ. Be saved by the truth of the gospel. Christ went to the cross to save a people unto himself and to help those people walk as Christ walked. But that's the order of things. It's faith and then sanctification. You become more like him. So come to Christ. I want to close um, by reading the lyrics to a song. Uh -huh. In the last six months, I told you, just crazy times for us. This song meant a whole lot for us when we were walking uh, through the things that we uh, 
had walked through. And so um, I, I want to read it to you. The song is called, you've sung it here, I believe. It's called Be Still My Soul. And I just want you to hear the lyrics of this song and hear the encouragement that the, this uh, writer has given to us to sing. It says this, be still my soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, your best, your heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, your God will undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Your hope, your confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul. The waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he lived below. Be still, my soul. When dearest friends depart and all is darkened in the veil of tears, then you will better know his love, his heart, who comes to soothe your sorrows and your fears. Be still, my soul. Your Jesus can repay from his own fullness all he takes away. Be still, my soul. The hour is hastening on. When we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone. Sorrow forgot and love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul. When change and tears are past. All safe and blessed. We shall meet at last. Let's pray. Father, I pray collectively as the bride of Christ gathers today that we would grow in our casting our anxieties upon you because you care for us. There is an enemy who wants nothing more but to steal, kill, and destroy. And so often he does that through the worries of the world and the anxieties of life and the stresses of our own heart. I just pray, God, that you would fill us with a greater understanding, a greater faith. Help our unbelief. Because at the end of the day, that's what anxiety is. It's, it's unbelief. It's unbelief that our God will come through again. That the future will be taken care of as it has the past. You've been faithful, God. We have no reason not to trust you. So, Father, would you help our unbelief? Would you grow us to be more like Christ, to see the things of the world as, as they are, which is temporary, time-stamped, and that we would set our eyes to Christ who is forever. And there's coming a day when we'll be around the throne and we'll all be praising Christ and singing holy, holy, holy is the Lamb of God slain on behalf of our sins and the stresses that we dealt with yesterday and the stresses that we'll deal with tomorrow will have burned up and will mean nothing. Give us eyes to see that our hearts would hear the message. Do not be anxious. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. We love you, Lord. Help us to love you even more, to trust you even more. In Christ's name we pray, amen. we've heard
God's word work in our hearts. Our hope is built on nothing less in Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. Blood in right. 
work in our hearts. Just allow the Holy Spirit to change you from the inside. I cast all my cares upon you, Lord. I'm going to seek you first. As we sing, you reign. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart. There is no higher name. You see. With faith, let all of heaven and the earth erupt in soul. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Let's just one more time declare that over our lives and our hearts this week. That God reigns over everything. We just give all of our time and our attention to Him. You say, You above it all. You above it all. Sing it like you believe it. Sing over every heart. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for what you have done at camp. We just pray that you would continue to do that work. You always finish what you start. So God, we we pray for these students to come alive in the name of Jesus. Let them be resilient, full of faith and full of hope. God, I pray for us as a church. I pray for those who are older. I pray that you would give them dreams again that they would not be tired, but that you would give them dreams and visions. Fill their hearts with faith, God. I pray that you would allow this church to be a church that is holy and set apart, full of life, that people would walk into these rooms and, and they would encounter God in us and through us and among us. God, I pray that you would fill my brothers and sisters up with faith this week as we live for your glory, for your renown, and for your namesake. It's in Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Amen. Live Sent Church.
universe and over every heart there is no higher name Jesus you reign above it all 